fun. And, and yet you probably could show this scientifically. You and your wife have started a, an intergenerational school, and you are finding some interesting things about the generations working together. That's right. We have uh, a school where older adults, including some who have memory problems, come together to share stories, uh, to create what collective wisdom by gardening, by using computers, by using multi-neurotransmitter lexical enhancement devices together, reading books. books. And the, the test scores for the kids are wonderful. And, and my wife and her staff deserve all the credit. Um, so we have 100 urban city African kids who are otherwise um, like uh, uh, those who suffer through uh, our regular public school system, and I hate to put it that way. We had 100% pass rate in reading and math in third and sixth grade last year. We are the, so we, we have got good objective uh, test scores. Not that that's the be all and end all. You know, don't get me started on no, no child left behind. Um, that's not the way to necessarily measure uh, education. Now what we're doing is saying those older adults, can we, can we do some scientific work to demonstrate that those folks um, uh, actually enjoy a higher quality of life and, uh, and, and their cognition is, is uh, preserved by participating in uh, the school. Does the social interaction and the storytelling that you talk about uh, seem to be as powerful um, a medicine, if you will, as exercise? Um, I wouldn't want to put exercise and cognitive stimulation against each other um, because I think it comes in a package. Um, so the best thing to do, of course, is to read a book on your treadmill, or actually the better thing to do is to listen to NPR on your bicycle ride. Whatever, whatever. Uh, the combination is better. Uh, um, but both of those things, the mental exercise and the physical exercise, will enhance your brain. And you see, people talk about crossword puzzles or, or games here and there. To me, uh, the thing that is likely to be the most powerful thing effect on your brain is to go into an environment where you have a sense of purpose. You're contributing. You have a legacy there in the school. Our volunteers are just loved by these kids. So you're a part of a community. You're promoting your own lifelong learning, and you're you have a sense of purpose. And you say we probably ought to give up on this fantasy of a single cure for dementia because dementia, after all, isn't a single thing. Well, dementia is certainly not a single thing. There's a long list you'll find in a textbook about what causes dementia, but they'll say Alzheimer's is the most common cause. Well, I'm saying Alzheimer's is plural as well. And, you know, I, I hate to say you should give up on fantasies or hopes, or, or, or but I, I, I think we should... We, we need to create a moral imagination in this world that encompasses um, a broader range of things than just the selfish needs of the baby boomers. Um, kids are in, are, are in jeopardy. Dementia caused by uh, lead poisoning in Cleveland. Uh, there's some evidence that, you know, you've you got to take care of your brain through your whole lifespan. So let's start with protecting the brains of our children so that we can make sure that when they're older adults, they themselves haven't started life off uh, uh, badly by being affected early in life. So your focus now is a lot on, on prevention and intervention. What prevention approaches, uh, aside from getting lead out of uh, uh, households throughout the country, what, what ones deserve our attention and make the most sense to you? Um, this planet is in real trouble with things like global warming and other, all, all kinds of environmental toxins. I mean, the poor veterans who are coming back from Iraq with head injuries are going to be a large cause of dementia. Uh, there are um, kids who, millions of kids who are dying because they either have infected water or no water or toxins in water. Those kids' brains are not going to develop. Uh, so let's, let's get rid of war. Let's get rid of our environmental um, uh, uh, bad habits. Um, uh, so you, you asked what. Now, those are huge agendas. But those are very important agendas. Uh, if we don't take care of those things, people are not going to have the opportunity to grow older because we're not going to be able to have a planet that's – look at Africa where people are dying before they get older. Well, let's talk about uh, prevention in, in this way. Um, heart health is brain health. Absolutely. I mean, it's funny uh, you, because if you look at a list of things that are designed to protect your heart or your brain – or for that matter, your favorite organ. Um, we won't go there, I guess. Uh, they are all the same list of things, cognitive exercise, physical exercise. Um, so aging, is, um, aging affects um, things uh, in your body in, in, many, in, in many ways, in common ways. So, so there is, there is a, there's a list of things that are good to do for practically everything. Uh, I'm wondering uh, how your colleagues feel about your, your new focus. 
Um, you know what? I think I'm articulating things that they actually believe um, because there isn't anybody who would – and I, I, listen, I can argue with uh, – the last time I was on NPR, I was with uh, a molecular biologist who's a friend of mine at NIA, and we were arguing this point. They will say it's not one thing. They will also say there's no clear distinction between aging and Alzheimer's. They will say, you know, do give us more money for research. And I think there ought to be. You know, we ought to continue our investment in research, but in this broader context, because there is, because to the extent that you can, you know, easily say, give us another billion dollars for research, that's kind of an easy thing to say. Give us a billion dollars to fix our health care system or fix gl global warming. Now, that's not even a large amount of money. So... To, the message I'm giving is a bit too is a bit more complicated than the simple let, simple one. Let's find a quick fix. So I would say that it depends on which of my friends you're talking about. But many of them are my friends. I've been in the free of real for a quarter century, so they can't totally uh, discount what I'm saying because I was and still remain one of them. We're talking about a population that is aging, and the burden on caregivers, I think, is going to be absolutely overwhelming in, in 20 or 30 years. What advice would you give to caregivers with this, this new mindset? Even the word caregiver is funny, because that when you label somebody as Alzheimer's, you label the other person as a caregiver. What I like to say is we're all caring for each other all the time. So let's realize that we ought to have a world where we are more care receiving and caregiving for each other and we should practice that through our entire lives. And on that note, we're out of time. Thank you so much for talking with us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Our guest has been Dr. Peter Whitehouse. He's a geriatric neurologist and neuroscientist at Case Western Reserve University.